For those who might be observing the first Passover with us, uh, this service is quite different from everything else we do. I mean, it, we, it is not nearly the exuberant service. And the reason for this is that the Apostle Paul told us that when we come to do this, we should examine ourselves before we partake of the Passover. And I think people like to focus on what the, what the night is all about, to look into their own hearts, and to be sure that their, their heart and their, their attitude is right toward God. As they either enter into covenant, for those of you who are doing this for the first time, or confirm their covenant with Jesus Christ for those of us who are repeat uh, observers of the Passover. So the service is a little different in some important ways. I don't know when it was that I first began to look at John 6 more in connection with the Passover. Uh, it's, it, John 6 is the chapter. Jesus has fed 5,000 people. They've tracked him down to wherever it is. He says, oh, you, 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 you're not here to see me because, you know, what I'm going to tell you, you're here because you've got your bellies full. Anyway, they had their little exchange that went back and forth for a while. And then finally Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. One of the most profound statements in the history of language, I am the bread of life. Even the I am seems significant in that context. And he goes on to talk to this about, he says in verse 40, that everyone who sees the Son and believes on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Now, for all of us, the idea of being raised up at the last day and getting everlasting life is a prize worth whatever price you would have to pay. Nothing is too great. No demand should be too great for that. And so that we look at this night thinking this is a time, this is an important and crucial moment, because Jesus would would say a little bit later in John 6, in verse 53, he said, Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up at the last day. These are powerful words, and, and it's, it's very, very difficult to grapple with what they might have meant to the people who heard him. Because it was at the end of this whole episode that says many of his disciples went back and didn't walk with him any longer. They basically said goodbye. And so I, I, there came a point in time where I began to make the connection between this and the Passover. That was not that difficult to make uh, because you're eating his flesh, drinking his blood. That's what the Passover is all about. But then there came a, at some point in time a deeper awareness of what these words might have meant to the people who heard them because the words that are used on this occasion are words of covenant. It is the oldest, you know, relationship known to man, the covenant relationship. And the eating of the flesh of a sacrificed animal or the drinking of the blood of that animal, which in some ancient cultures was what was done, was the way in which two people would enter into covenant with one another, and I think probably the way people entered into covenants with other gods in some occasions. Going far enough back, the Jewish encyclopedia tells us that Men would cut each other's arm and suck the blood out of his friend's arm. That meaning, I now have your blood in me and you have my blood in you. So that the idea of blood covenant, very old and not in the least foreign to the people who were here on this occasion and heard Jesus say that. Why his flesh and his blood? Well, because it was the flesh of the sacrificed animal that was eaten instead of blood that made that covenant take place in Hebrew cultures. But where did this go, you know? What did it mean? Uh, How are people to, to, what are they to make of this as they look at it? Then Jesus goes on to say in verse 55, John 6, My flesh is meat indeed, my blood is drink indeed. He that eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. Now, as I said, the people who heard that understood the meaning of blood covenant. But they had no frame of reference yet for what Jesus was really offering on this occasion. Frankly, I sometimes wonder if we do. Honestly, I think we, we drink deeply of the forgiveness of sin. We yearn for victory over death. 
We want to live forever. And so we happily come here on this night and memorialize Jesus' death. And we happily accept the symbols of his body and blood as our ticket to eternity. We're all under, we understand that, and we're happy. But there is more, a lot more. Did you catch the significance of this statement? It, it, some of these statements you read in the Bible can go right by you if you're not careful. He said, He that eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. What does that mean? Well, these are the words, again, of blood covenant. It's like the you know two men who become blood brothers. One sucks the other's blood, the other you know wide of the arm of the other one. I now have your blood in me, so that you are living in me and I am living in you. This should have been easily understood by these people, but when it came to the end of the whole segment, some of them just didn't get it, didn't want to get it, couldn't handle it, and maybe one of the reasons was because some of them understood that what he was about to offer to them was a covenant relationship with him, that they were in covenant with God and didn't feel that they could go down that road. I think this is important to understand what he said on this occasion is bi-directional. It goes two ways. He abides in us, and we abide in him. What does that mean? Well, coming to Luke chapter 22, verse 7, Then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare for us the Passover that we may eat. Now, all the discussions about Passover timing have faded to, into obscurity for me for this year. I could not care less about them. Because all the legalism has no place whatsoever on this occasion. Because on this occasion, we are dealing not with some legalistic ser- service that we do. We're dealing with something very real in our relationship with God. The disciples said to him, well, okay, where shall we prepare? He said, look, when you're entered in the city, you'll meet a man bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him to whatever house he enters in. And you shall say to the good man of the house, The master says to you, Where is the guest chamber that I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room furnished. Go there and get ready. So they went and found as he had said to them, and they made ready the Passover. And when the hour was come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. It appears that this was a catered Passover. This fellow is probably in the business of doing that, and every indication is Jesus had probably made arrangements with him ahead of time as to how his disciples would spot him. Men didn't carry pitchers of water. That was woman's work. And so that was the way in which they were going to note this guy. But on the evening when he got there with his disciples and they had sat down, they had begun to eat, he did something really unusual something rather astonishing to his disciples. They really didn't know what to make of it. In John 13, this is described, and for reasons that are not explained, this is not mentioned in any of the synoptic gospels, only in John. Uh, and it just uh, these, there are aspects of this that are just different. John doesn't mention some of the things that they have gone into. Supper being ended, John 13, verse 2. The devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God, he arose from supper, he took a, laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. He came to Simon Peter, and Peter said, You're going to wash my feet? He, this is incredible. I mean... Peter could not grasp what was going on here or why it should happen that way. And Peter said, look, God, I mean, Jesus said to him, what I do now, you're not going to get it, but you will understand later. Peter said, oh, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus said, if I wash you not, you have no part with me. Now, that is a, a serious statement made on this occasion. Why this? Why so strong? Well, Peter said, well, then not in my hands only, my hands, my head, everything. And Jesus brushed that aside and said, He that is washed needs save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. You are clean, but not all. Because he knew who would betray him. So he said, you're not all clean. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again, 
He said to them, Do you understand what I have done? You call me Master and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you ought also to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Now, I ask myself about this because of what I'm beginning to see increasingly in the Passover, that this is a moment of covenant. What does this have to do with it? As it happens, I think it has everything to do with it. Because what he is now beginning to do is to define the kind of relationship that is supposed to exist between you and me and you and one another. And he says, we're going to wash one another's feet. I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither is he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, happy are you if you do them. If I, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. And it seems clear enough to me that what he is basically doing is telling these men on this occasion, none of you is any better than anybody else. You are to wash one another's feet. There is no up, there is no down, there is only brother, sister, and fellow in the church of God. Well, he said, if you know it, happy are you if you do it. We know it, so now we're going to be happy. We're going to do it. If the women would rise and file into the back room back there, the men will be washing feet at the back of this room, so you guys can just stay seated until the ladies are all the way back in the other room. After this, and Jesus has drawn his disciples around him and says, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And I really don't know what that must have said to them, because they still did not understand at this time, by all the accounts of the Gospels, what was going to happen to Jesus. And in fact, when they did finally see what was going to happen, they were very unhappy about it, but they didn't know. And he said, I wanted to do this before I suffer, for I say to you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves, because I want you to understand, I'm not going to be drinking of the fruit of the vine now until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. Now, this is the stuff of an ancient covenant. One ate of the flesh of the sacrifice, and in the earliest times one drank the blood. And there could be no, no misunderstanding this on the part of any man who was there on this night, that what Jesus was offering them was a new covenant. Now, I don't know how it happened, but in the earliest years of the church, there were people who still believed, they were, I think, think of that sect of the Pharisees who believed, they still believed that they were under the Old Covenant. And maybe to some extent, being Jews, they were, but they did not, had not come to the realization that they were in a new covenant with Christ. And I think even in more recent years, there have been people who doubted whether or not Christians are under the new covenant or not. But look, this, is my, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. I don't know how in the world we can possibly sidestep what he says on this occasion. There's not much doubt about it. The Apostle Paul, when the time came for him to describe this to the Corinthians, and we should all give thanks for the, for the Corinthians being such uh, problems that they were. They were obstreperous, they were difficult, and thank God they were, because if they hadn't have been, we wouldn't know some things that we know. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11:23. I have received from the Lord that which I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. So the time when we're supposed to observe this is nailed down. It's now. It's tonight. It is the night of his betrayal. He took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. So this body, the flesh of Jesus Christ, which we must eat in order to have eternal life, is symbolized in the bread of this Passover service. So I'd like to ask you, if you would, to bow your heads, and I will pray that God will bless this bread as a symbol of the broken body of Jesus Christ.
Father in heaven, it's difficult for us to understand, even remotely, what Jesus was looking forward to on this night, what he had to expect between now and the next day this time, when he prayed over this bread, gave it to his disciples, and told them, this is my body which is broken for you. For he knew they did not what he was going through. In a way, we're in the same boat, even though we can look back historically and know what he went through. We really don't know, for none of us have experienced anything like what Jesus was going to endure on that night. He was humiliated in our place. He was wounded in our place. He was betrayed in our place. He was forsaken in our place. And all of us, whatever trial we have to go through, whatever misery we have to suffer at the hands of our fellow human beings, Jesus was there before us. And so I ask you now tonight to bless this bread as a symbol of the broken body of Jesus Christ, broken for us, whose stripes make it possible for us to be healed. In Jesus' name. Now I'll ask the gentlemen to come forward who are going to distribute the bread. being counsel for baptism, the minister opened up the Bible to Luke 14 and read to me that section about counting the cost. I didn't get it. I didn't really understand. Because to me, I was being offered eternal life. I was being offered forgiveness of all my sins. I was being offered a blank slate before God. I was going to have it all written off to be forgiven of my sins, to be reconciled to God, to be able to live forever, what's to count? There can't possibly be a price to pay that is greater than that. And that's a testimony to how little I understood about what was involved on that occasion. Because I don't know uh, to what extent, I, in fact, I'm quite certain that I did not really understand at that time that I was talking about entering a covenant with Jesus Christ nor did I have the clue what that meant. And at baptism, when you go into the waters of baptism, you are forgiven of your sins. You are, all sins are washed away, and you come up clean and ready to enter covenant with Christ. But that is a decision. You know, while you can't forgive yourself, that's a gift of God, not, you know, not of works, not a thing you can do. But having been forgiven, having been justified, now the opportunity for covenant is laid before you. In the same manner, Jesus took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do you as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Whoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily. Notice, not unworthy. It's an adverb. It's talking about the manner in which you do it, not your own personal worthiness. You don't have that. Whoever does it unworthily should be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. This was a very meaningful correction to the Corinthians who had been doing the Passover in a way that was unfortunate. So now I will ask God's blessing upon the wine as a symbol of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Father in heaven, bless this wine as a symbol of the blood of your son Jesus Christ which was shed for all of us on that afternoon on Calvary. It's impossible for us to understand it. It's impossible for us to express our appreciation, our gratitude, our love for you, for the love you've shown for us. But at this moment, Father, we confirm with your Son, Jesus Christ, our covenant with him, with that mutual requirement that he gave to us that whatever we ask, he would do it, and whatever he asks we also will do. So bless this wine now as a symbol of the shed blood of Jesus Christ in the, for the remission of our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. You gentlemen come and distribute the wine. <coughs> Well,
Paul went on to say, Let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eats and drinks unworthily eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. And I shudder to think of all the years that I observed the Lord's Supper with no idea whatsoever the significance of Christ's body. All was the wine and all the, the hymns that we sung, the power in the blood, there is a fountain filled with blood. Everything was about the blood I understood completely, but did not know about the, the body of Christ. I understand it. He says, because of this, many are weak and sickly among you, and some have even died. Because if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Man, that's profound. That is so profound. The ability to judge yourself is a tremendous gift from God, and by doing so, you avoid being judged by somebody less tolerant than yourself. When we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned alongside the rest of the world. So, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If any man is hungry, let him eat at home. Let's don't come together for condemnation. The rest I'm going to set in order when I come, and I would sure love to have heard the rest of that. The reference that Paul has here to being weak and sickly as a result of not understanding the Lord's body, I have always connected to Isaiah, the 53rd chapter, and I'll go there now. This is a prophecy which, uh, it's a startling prophecy in many ways, and it's, it's hard for a Jew, I would think, because... Generally speaking, when they see this one being spoken of in this way, the suffering servant or the servant of God, they're thinking about Israel, not about the Messiah or the Son of God. But it's pretty clear to me when I read it what it's talking about. He says, Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He has no beauty, no majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering, like one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. I wonder, you know, what in the world is the Jesus of our imagination like? Because basically, what he is telling us in the prophecy, that he will not be a person that you are magnetically drawn to because of his personal beauty, his charisma, or anything of the sort. There has to be something more. Surely, he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, but we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought, our pe brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. When I read that, it's, it's, it's very hard to realize that God put our iniquities, our suffering, our pain, all on him in that way. There is absolutely nothing that we go through in this life that Jesus did not go through before us. I think... For example, the, what was going to begin happened to him within a matter of an hour or so of the time he, that, the, that the Passover was held and his, his disciples were given the bread and wine. He would go to Gethsemane and he would pray for a while. <clears throat> then he would be betrayed by one very close to him. And which of us has not suffered some betrayal by somebody sometime in our life? We can't claim that God does not know how that feels. For now we have Jesus who was betrayed. Jesus was shortly thereafter forsaken by all of his friends. It ran off and left him. One of them running off naked into the night. Ever felt very alone when your friends cast you off and wouldn't call you or wouldn't talk to you? Or decided you weren't worth their time any longer? There's nothing new there, nothing there that Jesus does not understand or has not experienced. And so it was through that long night. The humiliation, the pain... The spitting, he gave his back to the smiters, his cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. The whole story is right there. So that none of us can really go to God and say, you don't understand how I feel. You don't understand. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. But then the song goes on to say, nobody knows but Jesus. And Jesus does know. Well, I'm so thankful on this night that, that after this, Jesus 
had a long talk with his disciples. It's striking to me, this is, because the Sermon on the Mount goes on for quite some distance, but I'm not sure it's quite as long as this. And it is really one of the longest of his discourses and one of the most profound for all of us to understand. It starts off in verse 14, John 14, verse 1. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house. Now, I don't know if we understand what that means. But when you study the Bible more carefully into the meaning of the word house used in this sense, it basically is a, is a term either for the government, as in the house of Israel and the house of Judah, whereas you have a ruling house and a whole people governed by these people. Or it's the house of a successful or well-to-do man like Abraham. And in Abraham's case, his whole house, not just his own flesh and blood were blessed, but his whole house were blessed, and his whole house came under the covenant. Remember his servants also had to be circumcised as signs of the covenant? So everybody in Abraham's house, whether they were one of his family, whether they had carried his DNA or not, they were in covenant with Abraham. They were in Abraham's house. Okay, when he says, in my father's house, he's using the term in those terms. His dynasty, his household, his family, his whatever you want to call what Abraham had, God has a house. And it's not just a mansion. It's not just some, you know, some, a mansion in the sky. It's real. It's a, it's a household. Abraham had a tent. That's all he had. But he had a house and a household. So in my father's household, there are a lot of rooms. I would have told you, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Where? In my father's house. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you may be where I am. You know the way to the place I'm going. And Thomas, an honest fellow that he was, said, Lord, we don't know how you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other way. No man comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you know him. You've seen him. Now, that one had to really, you know, kind of sail over their heads when he said, you've seen him. Because they wanted to know, well, what do you mean? What do you mean? And his answer was, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Verse 12. I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do greater things than these because I go to my Father. That's really kind of mind-boggling in a way. That we would do greater things than he because he went to the Father. That, how can we possibly do greater things than Jesus? Well, consider this. At the end of his ministry, on that day of Pentecost, there was a grand sum total of 120 disciples were all that was left. What happened to the rest of those 5,000 he fed on that day? God only knows. 120. How many disciples were there after the first day of Pentecost? 3,000, right? Another 5,000 later, and people were being baptized right and left. The growth, the, 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 and people were being healed. Uh, people were being raised from the dead. It just goes on and on and on. The things that the disciples were doing, even the things he did, and even greater things. He says, I, whatever I will do, whatever you ask in my name, so that the Son may be, bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I'll do it. If you love me, you will do what I command. Now, honestly, don't think we have understood very well what Jesus is saying here. The reason I think that is because we tend to use in Jesus' name as a formula to end our prayers and not just a whole lot more than that. But I've drawn the analogy recently. I won't belabor it. But when when Allie and I got married years and years ago, she took my name. And ever since that time... Everything she has done, she has done in my name. She applies for a driver's license. She applies for it in my name. If she writes a check, she signs it with my name, Dart. And so on it goes. We understand that, don't we, how this works? Now, what Jesus is saying to us 
You can go to the Father and ask anything because you are in my covenant, and he'll do it. That's essentially what that expression means. It means your family. In here doing this, carrying my name. And the sobering thing to me about this is it means anything that I do in his name is important because if I do something bad in his name, it reflects on him as well. So we have to understand that. But these are the terms of our covenant. We bear his name. He will do what we ask. We agree to do what he commands. You know, this is really remarkably similar to the old covenant at Mount Sinai. God gave people a set of commands. The people said, everything God says to us, we'll do. So they ratified that and uh, the, uh, the covenant, ratified it with blood, by the way, and carried on into the promised land. And then they broke covenant, which is always a possibility that people have to look at. Unfortunately, for the most part, I am afraid people behave like consumers, as members of a covenant, not as partners. And that's basically what is meant. The word fellowship, which we toss around to refer to cake and coffee and uh, whatever it is we serve up after church, uh, is not what the Greek word means. The Greek word koinonia, translated fellowship, means partnership. That basically we are partners with Christ. And if we're partners, if you're a partner with him and I'm a partner with him, what does that say about you and me? Partners. Just the same way. And I think the foot washing service should really remind us to, more than it does sometimes that we have things to do for one another. We are responsible to one another. We are responsible for one another. And it's because we're family. Jesus said, I will not speak to you much longer, for the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold on me, but the world must learn that I love the Father and that I do exactly what my Father has commanded to me. Come on now, let's leave. So they got up and they wandered out. The rest of this conversation is, I guess, strolling off toward the Brook Kid Run. Jesus then says these extremely important words for us to understand. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so it will be even more fruitful. Now, I, I don't know how many sermons over the years I've heard about this, you know, this particular theme, and it's a good theme, and I, everything I hear I like, but it's very profound when you start thinking once again in terms of the fact that we are in covenant and that you can actually be broken off if you don't bear fruit. Now, we may want to ask ourselves, well, wait a minute now, for me, what, what would for me be fruit? Well, I don't know for you, but you better find out because it's important. He says, you are, also, you are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Now remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If any man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Because apart from me, nothing. Nothing. And this remain in me and I remain in you are words of covenant. You know, we are tied closely to Jesus Christ. If any man does not remain in me, he's like a branch that's thrown away and withers. They're picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask what you will, and it will be given for you. This is my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. Now, I want you to understand something. This is not a hair-splitting, legalistic thing Jesus is requiring of us here. It's not requiring that we get the last little gnat's eyelash of every single law in the Bible squared away before he will actually work with us in this regard. It is a matter of love for a partner in covenant. 
if my wife's car breaks down in the Walmart parking, parking lot and she calls me for help, I don't ask myself, do I really have to do this to be a husband? <laughs> Thought never crosses my mind. I go because I am and we are in covenant. We are married. We love each other. We've been married for 54 years. For me not to go to help her when she's in trouble would be to deny myself. You understand? I said, I'll be right there when she calls me. And I, I, I go. When Allie had surgery years ago, I stayed right by her side until she finally felt good enough to tell me to go home. And I was there. When I had surgery, she was there for me every day and wept for the pain and the misery that I was having to undergo in that naval hospital in Balboa Park in San Diego, California. We don't do these things because it's the law. We just, you know, it's not, that's not the point. We do these things because we are committed to each other. And then I think this is a good night for us to really examine our commitment to Jesus Christ and why we do the things we do. Are you just doing it because you have to? Well, if you are, you have a few things that you're going to have to learn. Legalistic nitpicking is not what this covenant with Jesus is all about. It's about a permanent, wholehearted commitment to him. You know, has he shown his commitment to us? Do we have any right to ask for more? Not really. Nor do we have any reason to whine about our lot in life when you get right down to it. Now, Jesus went on in verse 11 of John 15 to say, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Wow, wow. You realize what he just laid on these guys? And in turn, what he has laid on us? That we're supposed to love each other in the same way that he has loved us. And he says, greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Most of us don't have to lay down our life, maybe 15 minutes, an hour, hour and a half, most of our life, and sometimes have a hard time doing that. Greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. I call you friends. Good grief. Do you understand what he's saying here? Abraham is the one man in all the Bible who is called a friend of God. And now Jesus is offering that friendship to anyone who will come into covenant with him. Call you friends. Everything I learned from the Father, I've made known to you. You didn't choose me. I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my commandment. Love each other. And I don't think he's going to cut us a whole lot of slack for not doing that. Because if we expect it from him, we sure have got to give it for one, to one another. Because as John said, whoever doesn't love his brother whom he can see, how can he say, I love God, whom he can't see? And in fact, one of the ways that God gives us the chance to love him is by putting people in our way who need love. Keep that in mind. I think, again, we first think of our covenant with Jesus without realizing that there is a corollary. In other words, his covenant made with us. I am in covenant with Jesus. You are in covenant with Jesus. And what does that say about the relationship between you and me? We're in covenant with one another. When one of us is in trouble, we're all in trouble. And we really need to start thinking that way. Jesus said, though I've been speaking figuratively, a time is coming when I'll no longer use this kind of language, but I'll tell you plainly about my Father. In that day you will ask in my name, not as a formula stuck on the end of your prayer. You will ask because you are in my name. I am not saying that I will ask the Father on your behalf. No, the Father himself loves you because you love me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and entered the world. Now I'm going to leave the world and go back to the Father. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son that your Son may glorify you. 
For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those whom you have given him. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me. They accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. That believing is the central point. I pray for them. I don't pray for the world, but for those that you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, all you have is mine, and glory has come to me through them. That's an interesting thing he says there, that glory has come to him through these 12 guys that he was keeping this last Passover with. He says, and then it goes on, I will remain in the world no longer, but they're going to have to be here. I'm coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction, so that the scripture would be fulfilled. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word. The world has hated them because they are not of the world any more than I am. I think that is something really that's, that's important to understand. The world is going to hate us, but they hated Jesus before they hated us, and they hated the Father before they hated Jesus. That's where all that stuff goes back. Well, that's the last prayer. There's more to it that Jesus had on that last night. But at the end, they sang a hymn, and they all went across Brook Kidron to the Garden of Gethsemane on that night. So if you'd all grab a hymnal, we'll close with him. Abide with me. I will read a hymn. 57.